And the markets were kind of shook by this. China's deep seek AI technology, it was something that a lot of people were surprised by. So why exactly is this so concerning for so many people? Well, uh, it is concerning on different levels, Jaden. Um, most importantly, uh, this kind of is a, is a, a debunks this uh, trend in the U.S. towards big data models. You know, by by big data, I mean this current generative AI, large language models. They are essentially data guzzlers, if you wish. Uh, they devour data. Uh, they thrive on data. We can use different languages, um, and the reason they do that is that uh, is that they they are built on this paradigm, which is called machine learning. And machine learning, which is very different from human learning, uh, needs a lot of data uh, for these machines to be trained. Training is the the first step. The collection of data and then training are the first steps towards the machine learning and um, these systems that have been developed by OpenAI and Google and other major players in the U.S., uh, they need a lot of data to be trained. Uh, this new model, you know, uh, from from DeepSeek um, follows a different, somewhat different paradigm in the sense that it grabs the model, grabs data when as it is needed. It doesn't need to to be <coughs> to be drained at large volumes data all the time, and. Um, that was a big surprise to many, uh, including the stock market, of course, because, uh, well, you know, there was a lot of investment, uh, not only uh, in AI models, but uh, in hardware that is behind and drives these models, uh, including the you know GPUs from NVIDIA. And that's why NVIDIA was very much uh, hit by this. So that's that was uh, one level of the surprise that maybe the uh, the most fundamental technical level. Would it be accurate to say that China has taken the lead on AI or has the apparent advantages that this new deep seek technology has been oversold? I wouldn't go that far. This is just, you know, uh, one one stage in uh, the long history of developments. Generative AI machine learning did not come out of the blue, you know, unlike the public perception that large language models were just the products of, you know, the last two or three years, they have been in the making for decades, uh, literally, you know, the very first AI models were neural networks, perceptrons and so on. And there were winters and summers and so uh, And uh, at some point, they finally, you know, uh, made it, they became, it became the dominant paradigm, which, you know, as I said, and uh, they, they go by different names. Initially, they were neural networks, then they were called connectionist models. Uh, now, uh, for the last decade or so, they are called machine learning systems. Uh, and uh, I think uh, th that all goes by way of saying that uh, this is just one paradigm. I recently said in another interview, it is uh, going to change. You know, we are absolutely going to get new paradigms and who knows what. You know, if we knew already, uh, you know, that would have been uh, <laughs> uh, uh, interesting, but we don't. And people are looking for different ways of doing uh, this. And I'm pretty sure, you know, we say, I can say confidently that we are going to see new models. And if that happens, um, who knows who is going to be ahead of the game? You know, it could be China, it could be the U.S., it could be part of the U.S. in, you know, uh, ecosystem, uh, or it could be somebody else. So I wouldn't, you know, name this as, you know, or, or call this as the final victory of China or anybody for that matter. And obviously, AI is a space that the U.S. and China are highly competitive in and are leading the world in. So why is it such an area of interest to both of these nations? Well, you know, um, AI has a lot of potential for innovation. For an, uh, Innovation is what animates markets, capitalist markets. And when I say capitalists, that equally applies to the Chinese markets, uh, although they would like to call themselves not capitalist systems, but they are markets nonetheless, right? So uh, innovation animates markets and AI is at the forefront of the, this, uh, you know, these innovations um, currently and for the last few years and maybe for the next few years or maybe longer. And that's why it is such a big deal between, between the, the US and China. Of course, uh, some people understandably elevate this to the level of uh, to the level of national security, and I understand that concern as well. 
uh, but but uh, I guess we can understand this or uh, you know interpret this you know competition between the U.S. and China um, as un- as something happening at these different levels: the market, economics, you know, uh, national security, uh, science, technology. And, you know, somewhat similar to what we had in the past between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. You know, back then it was space exploration. Um, then it was the U.S. and Japan, it, it, which was, you know, computers. And, you know, there was some kind of AI involved in the late 80s. And now it is between the U.S. and China. But obviously, the pendulum will swing. But if we were to define a clear leader, what advantages would be coming from having that first place spot? Well, <laughs> uh, it depends on who, who you ask. You know, if you ask a national security expert, they say we are going to have the upper hand in this, uh, you know, uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic competition between the U.S. and China. If you ask uh, uh, a businessman, uh, they are going to say that we are going to have an upper hand in, you know, in the market. We are going to be able to produce and innovate uh, and create new products faster than the Chinese and then send it to the rest of the world um, and so on and so forth. But, you know, you, you might ask a scientist even and they, they, have a, they might have something to say about this as well. My way of thinking is that there's a lot of room for actually for cooperation. You know, they, they just put a pandemic behind a few years ago. Most of us have forgotten, but, you know, AI technology can be very useful in fighting, stopping the next pandemic before it gets too far, uh, in developing, you know, vaccines. Uh, and all of this requires cooperation between nations, including the China, especially including the China and the, U- China and the U.S. So I would like to, to also highlight that fact that there, let's not forget that there is room for, for cooperation on a global scale for things like, you know, health, pandemics, climate, you know, you name it. And I think that that's a great segue into what I was going to bring up next, which was just coming up with the guardrails, because obviously with social media, the advent of that technology, we were really behind when it came to privacy laws and the ethical guidelines. Now we're going into AI and we haven't even addressed the technology of social media. But to go back to AI, I mean, how do you bring the U.S. and China to the table on this? Because obviously the way ethics and obviously privacy are going to be interpreted is going to be different. Well, we would like to think of ourselves, by uh, we, I mean, uh, uh, the U.S. Americans as, uh, you know, holding the higher moral ground. So we have to, in this case, we have to act accordingly. We have to uh, to make sure that these technologies are developed uh, with the right safety measures in mind, uh, uh, because in the short and in the long run, it is going to affect us as well and the rest of the globe along with it. So uh, if you take that perspective, yes, competition matters. I understand that. But... Well, but we should also make sure that these technologies do not do more harm than, than you know, help. Uh, I'm not of the camp who believes that AI is a threat to the human existence or there's an existential threat. I, I find those, uh, you know, hyperbolic, even nonsensical, to be honest with you. But, I underst- but at the same time, by the same token, I think that there's lots of risks if we do not, you know, uh, Put the right guard lives and social media is the most recent example of this so we have to really pay, take this very seriously uh, and uh, make sure that you know before it's too late that we, we put this on the right track you know uh, the, the metaphor of the guardrail and the track and so on they somehow come together uh, we put it on the right track so that you know uh, we don't find ourselves a few years down the road in a similar situation as we are with social media now For sure. I think that there are lessons to be learned from the 90s and, of course, the early 2000s when we were first trying to navigate the Internet. I think that a lot of us hopefully have learned from that. So let's hope for better this time. Hopefully, yes, indeed.